Congressman Dean Phillips bucked his own party by calling for change at the top of the Democratic ticket, even putting up a fight in a primary. Now he's retiring from Congress and is reflecting on what he thinks Democrats could have done differently this election to avoid defeat. He sat for an interview with WCCO. Take a listen. Congressman, which, you know, almost private citizen Dean Phillips, how are you fe feeling about this transition for you? Well, you can imagine, Caroline, it's bittersweet because this was, I mean, to any outsider watching the activities in Congress, I would imagine most think that it's insufferable and miserable and no camaraderie. Uh, but the reality is it's been joyful. Uh, mm -hmm. Great friendships on both sides of the aisle. You know, helping people here in Minnesota has been extraordinary, a great blessing to me. I've been helped by so many in my past to, to pay it forward was a blessing. Uh, so it's bittersweet because the dysfunction, which is really what I want to spend the rest of my years trying to address and at least uh, shine light on, uh, that's frustrating. I'm mm -hmm. not going to miss that one bit, mm -hmm. but I'm going to miss the people and the responsibility and public service is something I want to inspire young people uh, and more of us, everybody watching right now, to do something you know, to serve our great state and great country because we need it. Uh, so I'll miss that, but I'm not going to be away for long. I'm going to take a breath and uh, hopefully uh, start a next chapter that can help resolve uh, some of these issues and get back to problem solving because that's what most people ultimately want. You're also former presidential candidate, Dean Phillips, uh, for a short time there. Let's talk about that a little bit. So when you launched that campaign uh, to mount a primary challenge against uh, Joe Biden, uh, your bid was at best dismissed as a vanity project and at worst ridiculed by members of your own party. So. Now that the results are in at this election, do you feel like saying, I told you so? It would be not human to not have some of those feelings, of course, but that's not my style and grievance has never served me well. And to those who said things, including some elected officials right here in Minnesota, uh, they knew the truth when they were saying those things and they've got to live with that. So, um, and we didn't win, you know, so this notion of a victory lap or I told you so, that doesn't serve any purpose. And I think, if anything, I think we have to get back to the time where we remembered our golden rule, you know, the things we learned in kindergarten, mm -hmm. which is don't gloat, don't demean your neighbor, uh, don't be offensive and disrespectful, do the opposite. So mm -hmm. I wanna try to model the behavior that I think the country needs. And that means no victory lap, because A, we got crushed, and B, no, I told you so, because um, I didn't succeed. Mm -hmm. uh, but that means I'm gonna keep trying. But you were the first, before you even you know, formally announced a bid, you were the first Democrat, I believe, that publicly saying that Joe Biden should not run for re-election. That was in July of 2022. That is two years before the drumbeat of Democrats after that debate performance saying that he ought to step aside. So with that in mind, do you really think truly now with that hindsight that if there was an open primary, a Democrat would be packing up to go to the White House, or were the political headwinds in this election, stubbornly high prices, a border crisis, uh, just too big to overcome, that no matter who the Democrats had chosen potentially in a process like that, that you would be in the situation you are in today? I, I would never try to, I wouldn't have the hubris to tell anybody that if we had just done it this way, we would have won, because there were headwinds. And I think those were not something that could have been solved in a matter of months. Uh, I think this is really a reflection of a Democratic Party that has lost touch with where a lot of the country's at and taken many of the core constituencies for granted. But one thing is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. Had we uh, pursued a competitive primary, yes, we absolutely would have elevated a candidate better positioned to win. There's no question whatsoever. And furthermore, what really troubled me when I did end up running, which I didn't do until I tried my darndest to call attention to A, the issue. I made private calls to candidates who were much better known than I, who were ready to enter a presidential contest with the support and network in place. Uh, and I made public calls for others to join this uh, primary. Uh, none of them were heated, and I know why now, because when you take that chance, when you jump into a primary against an incumbent, you're probably gonna never have a chance again because the party will attack you. That said, yes, we would have had a much better chance to win. Uh, had President Biden debated me and Marianne Williamson or others in the primary, the country may have seen up close and personal many, many months before it actually happened, a president who probably wasn't gonna be able to su uh, succeed in an election and serve another four years. So that does trouble me. And that's why I'm more focused, I was more focused on the process and the Democratic Party suppressing the very elements that we needed to expose if we were gonna succeed. 
Uh, sadly, we then elevated someone without, uh, I say it was selection, not election. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the problem. And uh, I'm afraid that those who are participating in primary politics, those who are choosing our candidates, they're active, they're engaged, but they don't represent most of America. And that's the fundamental challenge right now, Caroline, is 5% maybe on the far right, 5% on the far left, the people that vote in primaries every year, the active energy of the two parties, are elevating candidates who fit ideological profiles, but by definition, they don't fit the profiles of center-right, center-left Americans. Mm. So this wasn't just about Joe Biden, wasn't just about the Democratic Party. This is about a process and a duopoly, two private corporations, uh, that would have us believe that this is the only way the system can work, and the irony is it's not working at all. So I think we need competition if we can't, in this case, reform the Democratic Party. Let's tease that out a little more, because you talked about you, you feel you'd, the, the Democrats would have been in a better position if there was a primary, had Joe Biden had said two years ago that he was not going to seek re-election. So is that to say that you, th I mean, but ultimately he wasn't at the top of the ticket. It was Harris, you know, with, with 100 days to go. So do you think her, it was her as a candidate and that she would not have prevailed in such a primary? Because certainly if that happened, that she, she would have probably thrown her hat in the ring. Is, yeah. it, is it that the process didn't happen or is it that, that, that Harris was a fundamentally bad candidate and chosen with not enough time to get her name out there? Well, it, it would be of no benefit to anybody for me to opine on Joe Biden or mm -hmm. Kamala Harris. What I will opine on is the rest of the country. And the rest of the country was pretty clear that Joe Biden was not someone they wanted to see as president again. And the country was actually pretty, well, very clear in the election, but even the Harris campaign is acknowledging they didn't have any polling that showed her beating Donald Trump. But they kept that from the country. And therein lies one of my great, great uh, sources of dismay, is because when people have, that have access to truth, knowledge, uh, and potential selflessness, and they protect their position, their power, their prestige, which I think many did in this case, we're going to get this outcome. And the truth is, I don't think she could have won. And I do think a competitive process would have identified a candidate who could, a Gretchen Whitmer perhaps, a Josh Shapiro, uh, it could be a Gavin Newsom, it could have been me, it could have been any number of people, but we'll never know that because the party suppressed that possibility. And by definition, in the United States of America, the Democratic Party should be promoting competition, not suppressing it. Do you think you would have won if you were given the opportunity to litigate those issues in, in a primary process? and then gone on to beat Donald Trump? Oh, if it was Donald Trump versus me in a general election, do I think I would have won? Yes. And I'm one, of, I'm one of 10,000, if not maybe 100,000 Americans of competency, decency, respect, experience that could have won. And that's exactly why this system is not serving the interests of Americans. Forget Democrats, it is not serving Americans because the truth of the matter is, even with the turnout that we had, the majority of Americans are really disappointed. They were disappointed in both candidates. They're disappointed in this process. Over 50% are not identifying as Democrats or Republicans any longer. Uh, and the truth is we need more people to participate because yes, a lot of people could have won. And that's the problem. We suppressed instead of expanded. Part of this finger pointing among Democrats is, is trying to understand you know, who's to blame or what was to blame. And, and part of this reckoning has been a, a, a bit about working people you know, have shifted away from Democrats when Democrats prided themselves on being the party of working people. And now its perception is that it's the party of wealthy, elite, college-educated individuals. You know, you're one of the most wealthy people in Congress. How do you feel that you would have connected to a voter in that way? Obviously, we're playing hypotheticals, yeah, but I think it, sure. it gets to the broader point of how do people like you in your party connect with the rural voter in greater Minnesota who is just trying to get by looking at prices at the grocery store? It's a totally reasonable question, and I can understand why on the surface that's something that might be on people's minds. But the truth is I've lived on both sides of advantage. I lost my father in the Vietnam War, grew up poor in St. Paul, uh, could not afford college, so earned an ROTC scholarship to attend the University of Minnesota and was killed in the Vietnam War when I was just six months old. And then I was adopted into an amazing family by an amazing new father, uh, and I got lucky. So that my whole, uh, my ethos, my, my spirit of uh, public service is derived from gratitude. And with gratitude comes with the recognition that I'm lucky. And I think there's nothing more profound for public officials than to recognize their good fortune 
and thereby try to do for others and share with others what has been shared with me, only because of a twist of fate. And there is truth to what you just said. The Democratic Party has abandoned rural America. It has lost the Democratic Farmer Labor Party here in Minnesota. A disproportionate number of farmers and laborers are not even voting for the party with their name in it. If that is not evidence of the fact that we have lost our way, I really don't know what is. And that could have easily have been recaptured, but it takes intention. And you're right, become a party of somewhat elitists. Uh, we like to preach, I think. We like to impose our policies and our values rather and use confrontation and condemnation rather than invitation. And that is the worst recipe uh, for success in business, in life, and certainly in politics is condemnation. And until my party recognizes that we have to welcome people in, that we have to celebrate this, uh, the mega movement and people who are just angry, doesn't make them people of low character or racists or bigots or anti-Semites, it just means people are frustrated. And we condemn them instead of invite them. And that is the most profound lesson I've learned. And I want to remind my party uh, that that's the way forward. The New York Times did an analysis of each county in the country and more than 89% shifted to Donald Trump mm -hmm. compared to 2020, sure. the, the outcome in, in that election. As Democrats parse this out, I mean, you've kind of said as much here that you think it's about connection, but why do you think that is? Why did people shift so much in the other direction compared to four years ago? Because I think people are sick and tired and they saw in Donald Trump a candidate who promises disruption. And to base Democrats, uh, they found that unappealing and dangerous and antithetical. But in democracy, the whole point is to listen to where the majority is. And the majority of this country is very uh, disappointed in how our system is working. And one candidate promised change. Do I think most people who voted for Donald Trump know what they're getting? Yeah, a bull in a china shop. Uh, he will do some things that will be probably good for this country. He's probably going to do some things that will have some great negative consequences. But at the end of the day, that's what this is really about. Uh, in fact, in this recent election, uh, Floridians overwhelmingly voted to protect women's reproductive rights. Missouri, they voted to expand um, paid family leave, raise the minimum wage, Alaska. Democratic policies were favored by voters in deep red states who also voted for the man who is opposed to these policies. And if that's not evidence of what's really going on, uh, it kind of becomes a culture issue. It becomes an issue of not recognizing why people are upset. It does not mean the Democratic product is that terrible, uh, but it means the packaging, the messengers, uh, and frankly, the system uh, that is suppressing competition, I think is responsible. And, and I give Donald Trump credit for recognizing where most of this country is at. And while his character and his approach uh, deeply concerns me, uh, I do not condemn those that follow him and that have invested in him and that believe in him because I happen to share a lot of those perspectives about what needs to happen with this federal government that has completely been mismanaged by Democrats and Republicans for generations. It is bloated. It lacks strategy. It doesn't reward people the right way. It lacks accountability. And all you need to do is sit in traffic here on 494 or 394. You have to look at the poor achievement of our kids right here in Minneapolis. Look at crime. Look at our southern border. Look at the issues facing this country, and we can't pass a budget in Congress. And people are uh, sick and tired of it, mm -hmm. and I get it. So I understand why people want someone to, in some ways, metaphorically, shake things up. And I think that's what this is about. Democrats and Kamala Harris wanted to kind of maintain the status quo. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is antithetical to where uh, this country's at right now. You talked about the message and the messenger and potentially a, a disconnect there with what Democrats you know, stand for and how they're telegraphing that to Americans. But so much of this message, of this campaign, was Donald Trump is a threat to democracy. That's what came from Democrats across the board. So was that, uh, that, di that didn't work. So was that, a, was that a fundamental misread of the electorate to frame it as such, mm -hmm. that Donald Trump is a threat to democracy? I think so. And I think he is a threat to some of the elements of our democracy. He's clearly threatening our democratic institutions. In fact, he's very public about wanting to dismantle a number of them. Uh, but the notion of using that as your primary approach, which by definition means you are condemning the people that support him as anti-democratic or threats to democracy. Mm -hmm. 
And, and when you demean someone in politics, it's like demeaning someone in your own household or a family member or a friend. They're going to be angry about it. And I think that anger only helped Donald Trump in, in many, many ways. And the fact of the matter is, the way that my party approached this recent primary was terribly anti-democratic. Uh, next door to us in Wisconsin, Ben Wickler, you know, taking my name off a primary ballot, and we had to appeal to the Supreme Court of Wisconsin that overturned it. Mm -hmm. North Carolina, uh, uh, Florida, same thing. And it wasn't well reported, but the truth is uh, no party has a monopoly on protecting democracy. And I would encourage my own party to take a look at the mirror right now because the way it conducted itself in this past election early uh, was, I think, uh, reprehensible. Uh, with all that said, Kamala Harris believes in the foundations of democracy. Uh, Donald Trump, I don't believe, does. And that's why I hope he surrounds himself with uh, advisors that recognize the consequences of uh, some of this destruction and a Congress that will show some degree of independence when necessary to ensure that more than anything else that the Constitution is upheld. The oath is to the Constitution, not to a president, not to a party. What I'm hearing in your kind of take on the postmortem, if you will, is that Democrats, you know, were making charges of his being a threat to democracy, yet they abided by this undemocratic process that they wrongfully condemned Trump voters as as uh, bad people, um, and that that the Joe Biden and his age was a was a handicap from the start, and Democrats should have woken up to that sooner. Correct me if I'm mischaracterizing any of that. I, th I think you're right. Okay. You know, by the way, threats to democracy are not just limited to the institutions of democracy. A porous southern border is a threat to democracy. Uh, having tens of millions of Americans barely able to make ends meet is a threat to democracy. Uh, having low performing students throughout this country because of underinvestment mm -hmm. in education is a threat to democracy. Mm -hmm. These are all threats to democracy. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say no party has a monopoly on protecting it. And that's why I am encouraging both parties to really reflect on where they're taking this country right now. And for those tens of millions of Americans who probably feel like I do right now, center right, center left, reasonable, common sense mm -hmm. people, who are dismayed by what we're seeing. That's why I'm promoting the, the concept of competition if we don't see these parties reconcile the realities of what it really means to protect democracy. And that means more Americans have to be participating in the success of this country. And no party is doing that well right now. My point of bringing those up was to say that that has been kind of you know, discussed a little bit uh, in democratic circles about what went wrong and, and can we point to one single thing. But the reason I say that is I'm, I'm curious if there's anything more broadly you feel is missing in the discussion about what Democrats oh. did incorrectly um, or, or, or misread the electorate on that, that contributed to this outcome sure. or is it that it was just an election that, you know, some strategists I've seen point to that, you know, any incumbent in this post-COVID uh, space where inflation has been high has been rejected by their their people. Um, is that a, a fair assessment yes. in your view? I believe, as I was trying to do a year and a half ago, call attention to the two things that I really was hearing all around the country, including right in our backyard in my own district, that was on the front of people's minds, uh, which were the economy, the microeconomy, yes, the macroeconomy doing quite well. And we can make the argument that we recovered from COVID more quickly, that our interest, I'm sorry, inflation was actually lower here than most OECD countries. But the fact of the matter is way too many people struggling and my party was trying to tell everybody, the president, that everything's fine, we're doing better than others. But if you can't make ends meet, that is the worst, the last thing you wanna hear. Uh, the southern border is another. That has become a prominent issue in this country. Uh, when I was campaigning in New Hampshire, the northern border is an issue in many parts of this country. And rather than acknowledge it uh, and, and do something about it, I'm afraid that this administration and parties seem to want to ignore it into hoping it would go away. And uh, Americans don't let those things go away. So yes, we misread the tea leaves. Uh, but this is also more, um, uh, this is more of a disease beyond this last year, you know, which is uh, the notion of, of tolerance, for example. I love and I affiliate with this party because we tolerate, we love, we accept, we're compassionate. Um, we believe that everybody has great value, but we tolerate things like low performing schools. We tolerate bad systems. We tolerate overspending. We tolerate a lack of accountability. We tolerate uh, border crises. We tolerate the aggregation of wealth amongst just a handful of Americans when so many are struggling. 
And that tolerance in my party uh, is reaching a point where I think it's going to break us if we don't do something to remind Americans what we stand for and open our ears to the realities, uh, because we will not be succeeding in national elections uh, with the current people in place, with the status quo pursued, uh, and with a policy platform that is increasingly not serving the needs uh, of Americans. On the t tolerance point and, and what the Democrats stand for, who belongs in the tent, I'm curious if you have any thoughts about kind of the um, intraparty war, if you will, sure. over Congressman Seth Moulton um, and you know, Alyssa Slotkin, who won as a Democrat in a Trump, a state Trump carried Michigan, you know, said that Democrats obsess too much about identity politics and don't leave space for kind of a continuum of the progressive flank and, and the center left flank. Do you think that that's, you know, a, a real problem within the party? Frankly, it doesn't matter what I think. You know, numbers don't lie. And I would just ask anybody who, who wants an answer to this question to look at what white rural Americans did in this last election. Look at who they voted for. Uh, look at what they're saying. And all that matters is how they feel, not about how I feel or what I think. It's what Americans are feeling and thinking. And yes, in many cases, white Americans, white rural Americans in particular, feel that they've been totally abandoned by the Democratic Party. Uh, they believe that identity, uh, more than anything else, uh, is what um, uh, drives this party. Uh, they don't feel a home. They don't see themselves reflected in it. They see themselves condemned and demeaned, uh, and it's reprehensible. In fact, it's, it's, it's the worst thing for Democrats to do because this is supposed to be the party of inclusion, tolerance, welcoming. And as someone who went to a MAGA rally in Rochester, New Hampshire, when I was campaigning for president in the primaries, I was shocked at how nicely I was greeted with hospitality and friendliness and kindness. And I saw diversity in this crowd that really surprised me. A lot of people had never been to a Trump rally. And the message to me was the MAGA movement was much more welcoming and invitational than I ever imagined. And I'm afraid the Democratic Party is actually the one that is becoming quite exclusive. If you don't check the boxes, you don't look or pray or think the way that the party wants you to, that there may not be a home for you. And that's fine. If, this, if the Democratic Party wishes to pursue that strategy, it's a free country but it won't be a party that will succeed, and therefore those of us, center right, center left, pragmatic, common sense folks, are going to have to do something. Would you run for another political office? I would never say never. I'm not going to run for governor. I'm not gonna run for Senate here in Minnesota. There's no, no question. But I do wanna play a role. I'm gonna take a breath for a little bit. Uh, and some have asked, will I come back to politics? And I think the bigger question is, will politics come back to us, or are we going to have to do something? And I'm going to be assessing the next number of months uh, as to how I can play some role, but I'm not going to be quiet. And I didn't go through this, and I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, benefit from the blessings of this state and community and this country uh, to sit quietly. And um, I've learned enough now from my time in Congress about what doesn't work and why, and how money in politics and perverse incentives and self-preservation are all that matter to most people. Uh, and I recognize where most of the country is at, and they're good people. You know, on the right and left that just want things to work. And I do want to play a role somehow, some way, and someday in seeing us at least make some progress towards that end. So not a bid for U.S. Senate in Minnesota or governor in Minnesota, but in 2028 there will be an open primary for Democrats. Is that to say that you would consider running for president again? I think it's unlikely, but I will never say never. And I absolutely want to play some role in encouraging, promoting, mentoring, and inspiring young people to join and to participate and for other candidates to get on that stage. Uh, we have to move beyond this selection and into election. And that means people got to be on the stage to participate. So I'm going to be spending a lot of time encouraging people to do so. Become a firefighter, a police officer, a teacher, run for city council, school board, run for president. You know, goodness, that's what this whole country is about. And we have a crisis of participation right now that uh, I'm cognizant of and I want to do something about. So there are ways to affect change in this country, sometimes more profoundly uh, than with a public platform in elected office, especially when you got to spend 10,000 hours per week raising money, which is what my colleagues in Congress are doing. I'm going to be liberated to speak the truth, spend my time where I think it can be used best, and actually accomplish some things because the system I'm leaving uh, prevents that. Any regrets? None. If I have one regret, it's that I, that I didn't pursue some public service sooner so that I could have had a longer runway, perhaps, to actually affect the change uh, that I think is necessary right now. 
And of course, there are some moments that I would take back and some things I said and maybe a vote or two that in hindsight, if I'd known more, I would have changed. Of course, I'd be kidding you if I didn't uh, acknowledge some of the missteps. But my goodness, it was the most joyful, ma magnificent, meaningful experience of my life. Painful, but my dad used to tell me, you gotta walk through the rain to get to the rainbow. And um, I've walked through the rain, haven't quite found the rainbow, but I'm gonna quit, keep marching. And I love this state and I'm so grateful for having had the chance to serve it. Any advice for your successor, Kelly Morrison? <laughs> Kelly's a dear friend. Uh, we actually went to high school together, graduated together. Uh, Kelly won friendliest and I won best laugh. So I think there's a lesson in this to everybody that uh, in politics, a little levity and a little decency and some friendliness and a good laugh can go a long ways. And that's what I told her, you know, to uh, take a breath. Don't let the system uh, grind you up and spit you out. Uh, be resolute, uh, speak the truth, and I promise you the rewards will come. And I think she's going to be an ex extraordinary uh, representative for the 3rd District and a rising star in our party. Uh, and I'm really excited to be represented by her. Anything else before we let you go? No, I just want, I want to say thank you to the community that uh, gave me this chance, to a state that I love, to the people that have come before me, Democrats and Republicans. Um, to the Republicans that have become my friends in this state, Paul Gazelka, Paul Anderson, um, uh, there's so many others that I would love to say thank you to who have been decent and friendly and kind uh, and encouraging, and I've come to recognize how they've been portrayed by media and by you know, social media uh, is often ill-informed. Uh, Tim Pawlenty, Julia Coleman, other people that I've really come to appreciate, even if I see things differently than them. I want to thank them too. Uh, and I want to encourage those watching, Democrats and Republicans, to do it the Minnesota way because the rest of the country could learn from how we are still hanging on, perhaps by a thread, uh, of honoring the principles that we all learned so many years ago and uh, helping our neighbors, doing the right thing, but most of all doing it with respect. And um, I'm grateful and I just can't wait for the next generation to take the baton.